Communication is the highway upon which love travels. Okay? Communication is the highway upon which love travels. You can love one another. You can love God. You can be committed to one another. And if you can't get out inside of you what you really think and what you really feel, and if your mate can't do it in a way that doesn't attack and wound one another, I will tell you, in years and years of marriage counseling, there are people that love one another, love God, and no longer are together because they could not communicate and get to the heart of the issues. Uh, I told you earlier about that first couple years of my life and that professor sent us to marriage counseling and I bet 90% of it was learning to communicate. We didn't know how to resolve anger and we didn't know how to communicate. Well, you know what, there's a lot of issues that if you can't get the love traveling on the highway of communication, you're dead. And the frustration boils over, especially if you really love God and you want to get through and you want to express this to your mate, but you just keep getting knocked down. Pretty soon, the blame starts. Uh, the greatest, most vivid example, it's in your notes. It, it starts with, it all started with the car. Uh, it was early pastorate that I had in Texas many, many years ago, and uh, I love to play basketball. If you've ever heard me speak, you know I'm a basketball junkie and had the privilege of playing in college and then around the world for a couple, three summers. And this, these neighbors had a hoop, and so all, I knew <laughs> these are going to be my friends, I mean, you know, because I'm going to go play. And we started playing, and he had three boys, and I had boys, and one thing led to another, and I found out that he was there. He'd been through a couple very difficult relationships, and he had four teenagers, and uh, he was living with a gal uh, who'd been through some really painful relationships and a couple, three marriages, and uh, she had a tiny little girl, and they were all living together. And so we went down and played basketball, six, seven, eight, nine months. And uh, little by little, got a chance to share Christ with them. And, and then he came down one day, and I, I can still remember, you know, I was, I was weeding next to my mailbox, and Dan comes by. Why didn't you tell me? I said, what do you mean? Why didn't you tell me? I said, man, why didn't I tell you what? That you're one of those preacher types. You're, you're a pastor. I said, well, well, yeah, I am. He said, well... We've been kind of watching you and Teresa, and we've been listening, and we, we want to get married. Will you marry us? And I'm thinking, oh, boy. Um, I said, well, uh, I'll tell you what. One of the things I have is I always do six weeks minimum of counseling, and you really need to know what marriage is, and, and it's kind of hard. And so I want to talk about how that works, and I would love to meet with you and your wife, and Teresa will do it too. Well, we did it by about the third session. They both came to Christ. Amazing stories, great redemption, and uh, went through the whole process. And then now we're into this new marriage, six or nine months. They're both brand new in Christ. They both love God. They're both in God's Word. They're both going, I will say it's a good church. I got to be the pastor. It was, it was a great group of people. And uh, and so I, I came by, and he was in this traveling job where, you know, like Monday through Thursday, or even all the way to Friday, he'd be traveling all over America in sales, and then come home. Well, she's with four teenagers that aren't hers, okay? And they're making her nuts. And so he comes home, and he's thinking, oh, I haven't seen my wife. Let's go out to dinner. I'm going to really love her. We're going to have a date. Let's all this stuff. And she's thinking, we've got to resolve conflict with Bob at school, and you know, your other son, and your daughter. You know, She's dating this guy, and she's juggling all this stuff. And So anyway, they come home. And she's listening, and she's meeting with Teresa, and he's meeting with me. So uh, this is, listen, listen, they love each other, remember. They're committed to the Lord, remember. They're actually growing spiritually, remember. And so he comes home for the weekend, and she says, I want to be other-centered and grace-giving. So they go out to a beautiful dinner. They have a romantic evening. Uh, they take walks the next day. And, you know, but she keeps waiting for, when are we going to have the big talk? I mean, when are you going to sit down and talk about, you know, am I going to discipline these kids and they're too big for me? And what about these issues? And we've got all kind of things we need to do. Well, he wants to be other-centered. And it's getting cold in Texas, so it's Sunday afternoon, and he's going to get on a plane in about five or six hours. So he is out underneath the car changing the oil of her car to make sure the antifreeze. So he's loving her. All right? You got the story. I walk down. I know we're not going to get to play basketball. And my, uh, one of my kids runs out of the house and says, Dad, you better watch out. It's going like crazy down there. I said, well, what do you mean? So I, 
I walk up, and by the time I get there, I mean, it is a no holes barred. He's kind of half under the car, sitting up like that. There is veins, eyes bulbing. Uh, plates have already been flowing. There is cursing. There is you are this. Everything they've ever thought. I mean, like, all everything they brought into their marriage that was ugly, bad, they just spewed it on one another. And I mean, my, my, kid, my kid ran out and said, what happened? Well, that plate almost hit me when it went by and crashed against the wall, you know, and I said, well, get home, you know, and so I watched all this happen, and she's there thinking what? Man, I'm loving these four adults, you know, teenage adults, and I've got all this stuff on my hands, and you've been here two and a half days. We've had a decent talk, and you're going to get on a plane. I'm stuck with all this, and I don't know what we're going to do. And he's thinking, you know what? I have come home and I have whined and dined instead of getting a workout and doing some stuff I wanted to do. And I took these romantic walks and talks like Chip says we're supposed to do and all this jazz. And here I am out here trying to get your car ready for you so you're safe. And you treat... And I will... uh, I remember doing a debrief about a week later and hours with him, Teresa hours with her, bring them both together. Here's what I can tell you. He did what he did all weekend for one reason. He loved her. She did what she did all weekend because she loved him. They both put the other person first in a way that they understood to obey God. And they had one of the biggest fights that put a, uh, a barrier in their marriage that they never recovered from. See, we learned you need to love God and know his plan. They knew it. We said their barriers. They identified their barriers, and they loved one another, and they were operating to solve it. But what they couldn't do is they had not learned how on the highway of communication to get the love that was in in heart for his wife and her love for him on the highway of communication in a way that it could get received. And under pressure, they went back to the old ways. And you know, to this day, I know two people are no longer together who love one another, who both love God, because they didn't learn what we're going to learn right now. Let's talk about the communication process. We're going to learn what it is and how it works. Understanding the communication process, the definition is the meeting of meanings. Write the word meanings. Communication is not talking. It's when the meaning, what's in your heart, what do you really mean, somehow goes across this highway into the heart and to the mind of your mate. Norman Wright says, communication is the privilege of exchanging vulnerabilities. By the way, the word vulnerable, it means open to woundedness. See, great communication is always risky and often painful before it gets good. Uh, Norman Wright also says, communication is the process of sharing yourself verbally and non-verbally in such a way that the other person, listen, can both accept and understand what you're saying. So if you say it in a way where they can't accept it or they can't understand it, you don't communicate. You can say, I said the right words, I wrote it down, this is the way it is. If they can't hear it, you didn't communicate. And a lot of times we do things unintentionally completely unintentionally, that shut down the communication process. Many of us think, especially us as men, we think communication, look, that's what I said. I said I love you, okay? Look, I love you. You don't get it? What's, what's the deal? <laughs> I love you. Hey, I said it once. I said it twice. You know, you know, I love you, okay? Get over it. Now, what did my words say? Someone could have put that in a transcript and said, oh, my, Chip's such a wonderful husband. He just said six times in a row, I love you. Except that wasn't my tone of voice, was it? Notice on your notes, the complete message, words alone are about 7%. Tone of voice, 38%. Facial expression, gestures, posture, the nonverbal, 55%. And by the way, that's sometimes, as, as men, we get really frustrated because we, you know, we're, we're really trying but they can read behind. And some of you guys can do it too. It's, you know, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, let's, yeah, you know, yeah, we need that deep talk. Uh, yeah, go ahead, hon. What, you know, whatever. Just, I mean, tell me. I really want to hear. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, communication, that's, kids, yeah, let's go. No, I'm listening, I'm listening. <laughs> right? You see, Your body, your presence, your face, your tone of voice, your eyes, all of that is how we communicate with one another. 
And if we think I said the right thing, or I even meant the right thing, and if you think you got through, you may not have all. And I notice it's a skill. It's the highway on which love travels. It is a skill. It can be learned. But most of us did not grow up with models where people communicated clearly and well, and most of us don't know how. I mean, I spent about $90, and that was a student rate. I spent $90, I'm making $1,000 a month in seminary. And I've got three kids, I'm working full time, going to school full time. And I've got this little tiny apartment that you can live all that on a thousand. I paid $90 for 12 weeks in a row to learn how to communicate. So actually, I should be charging most of you for me telling you what these counselors taught me, all right? And then I have some passages that'll be helpful too. But it's a skill. There's five levels of communication according to uh, author John Powell who wrote the book, Why I'm Afraid to Tell You Who I Am. He says there's the cliche, level one, safe, shallow, you know, how are you? I'm fine. There's level two, reporting facts, refers to basically third person. Have you heard about the weather today? No, I think it's going to rain. There's level three, ideas or judgment. Risk begins here because there's attachment of yourself with the facts. So what did you think of that message last week in church? What do you think uh, about uh, the current political situation? Uh, what do you think about what we need to do with our money? Do you see? Now, now, now what you say may cause a little conflict, so it's getting a little bit more dangerous. Level four is feelings and emotions, laying self on the line. I feel hurt. I'm struggling. I'm depressed. Um, I was really offended last night when we were with that couple and you brought that subject up that, you know, you never talked with me about that. I, I, felt, I, felt, I felt really damaged. Level five is open communication, total honesty, mutual understanding, vulnerability, no holes barred. Now, on the left side of your notes, at the very top where it says level one, I want you to write the word safe and put a box around it. And then at the very bottom where it says level five, I want you to write the word dangerous. Because here's what you need to understand. Shallow communication is very safe, but it doesn't lead to intimacy. Intimacy occurs at levels four and five. It moves from safe to dangerous, but deeply fulfilling along with deeply painful conversations happen at levels four and especially at level five. And if you don't understand, then you'll start opening up and you'll start sharing and then some hard things are going to come out and you're going to get wounded and you're going to get hurt and instead of realizing, oh, this is normal, this is like we're at level 4.5 and I guess I need to be real sensitive to what the Spirit's saying so that before it comes out of my mouth, I really process it and instead of striking back, maybe I really need to listen carefully. There may be a nugget of truth into this. See, if you don't know it's dangerous, then you'll react, right? and pretty soon you'll close down. And we want to talk about, so how in the world do you move from uh, level one down progressively in different areas to level five? Intimacy always occurs at levels four and five. But some of you might be having this thought, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, I've tried that before, and you're right, there is a lot of pain. Um, I was really open before. And we've done some of that, and... You know what? If you're going to ask me to go there again, I'm not going to do it because it hurt too badly. And what I want to suggest is that you need some rules. You, you need some principles from God to build that highway of communication so you can go there without getting hurt. All right? So with that, let me give you five principles I believe that will transform communication in your home. Uh, if you open your Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, the context is really exciting because, you know, the first three chapters are about all these wonderful, great things that God has done. You're a new person in Christ. And then chapter four opens up, now walk in a manner worthy of your calling. In other words, how do you live out this new supernatural life? The Spirit of God has taken up residence in you. You've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness. You've been pulled into the kingdom of light. Your sins are gone. You have peace. The Spirit lives in you. You're a part of a new family called the church. You are going to be transformed. He says, how does it work? And in the first 17 verses, he begins to explain about who you are in Christ and how your mind needs to be transformed. And this supernatural thing called the, the church is called a community where he gives apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers so that he equip the saints to do the work in the ministry until everyone is mature 
And the idea is where we, all the fullness, we become more and more like Jesus. And then after he lays all that out, he picks it up and he says, okay, now let me target about five specific areas about how this practically works out in your relationships. How do you live out this new supernatural life, the spirit of God in you? You're born again. You're a Christian. How does it work in relationships? And he gives five very simple principles. Principle number one, you pick it up in verse 15, but he develops it in verse 25. And it's simply put, be honest. Write those two words down. Speak the truth in love. I mean, this is the key to communication. It is easy to speak the truth. It is easy to speak in love. It is very hard to speak the truth in love. I mean, you know, it's easy to speak the truth. You gained a lot of weight lately. What's the problem? Oh, nothing really. I think it's the lazy guy I'm married to. The truth is just right out there on the table. No problem here, right? But I'm not sure that's going to bring about good communication. Or you don't ever mention Areas that are of pain or a problem. Oh, you're wonderful. I'm wonderful. You're wonderful. I'm wonderful. No, you know, you're more wonderful. No, 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 no. You're wonderful that I'm more wonderful. And you just take all that junk, you don't face it, and you push it down. Speaking the truth isn't hard. Speaking in love isn't hard. Speaking the truth in love requires tremendous spirit-directed capacity. Notice what he says in verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, notice what happens. We are to grow up into all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Finish then with lying and tell your neighbor the truth. Well, your, your mate is a neighbor. We are not separate units, but intimately related to one another in Christ. It means that we stop pretending. It means we don't lie. And it means that in a very calculated, wise, God-ordained way, we begin to move into levels four and five, and we start talking honestly about areas that are of conflict, areas that are hard, Areas where you're dissatisfied. Areas where you feel wounded. But you speak the truth in a way where the other person can hear it because it's couched in, I'm not down on you. This is not payback. And I'm going to give you some specific skills toward the end about how to do this, okay? But what you got to do, we've got to be honest. You don't grow unless we're honest with one another. Uh, one One of the little applications I would give you right in your notes, make Direct requests. One of the things we do is we think our mates can read our minds. And so, you know, the car is uh, a quarter low on empty, and your husband drives your car, and it comes back all the way on empty. And you're frustrated and everything, and so what we go to is, you know, I can't believe he's so inconsiderate. Why does he leave my car that way? Well, you know, I'll get news for you. If he's anything like me, I don't know where my car is. Heaven knows I know what yours is. You know, often uh, my wife grew up with a dad who was like Mr. Fix-It, you know, like Mr. Rogers on steroids, except, you know, Mr. Green Jeans was there. And he'd make, he painted his house every three years, whether it needed or not. I didn't even notice when our house needed painted, okay? And so she's thinking, I'm going to be like him. And so she's assuming, well, you know, why have you, have you serviced the cars? Uh, they're not running, you know? <laughs> Or, uh, you know, when are we going to repair this thing? It doesn't look broken to me. That's way too much. You know, I, I wasn't good or bad. I just, my, you know what my dad was good at? Catching baseballs, hitting baseballs, playing basketball. He was a golden glove boxer. You know what I learned? I learned how to do sports. I didn't, you know, when something broke, my dad said, call the repairman. He couldn't do anything, and he reproduced after himself. And you know what she learned? Here's the skill. Make direct requests. You know what she started doing? Simple things like, Chip, are you going to use my car right now? Yeah, because I need it. It's got more room. Would you mind filling it with gas? Huh. No. In fact, I did. It felt like a hero. Ooh, boy, look at this, you know. In fact, I started changing the oil. I mean, she thought I was metamorphosized right in front of her. Speak the truth in love. Those kind of issues like that sometimes go unspoken for 10, 15, 20 years in marriages. Second, you didn't know this much was in the Bible, did you? Be angry. Deal with anger appropriately. Notice what it says. If you're angry, be sure that it's not out of wounded pride or a bad temper. Never go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that sort of foothold. That's a Phillips translation of Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. The literal translation is be angry. It's a command. It's an imperative. Yet, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Anger is the most destructive emotion in any marriage relationship. 
Anger is the distance between your expectations and your experience is anger. The difference between what you thought was going to happen and what you're currently experiencing creates anger. Now, sometimes it's justified, and sometimes it's not. It just, you know, they just tick you off a little bit, and it's because you're selfish. But he says, be angry. If you don't deal with that anger, and if you push it down, you know, some researchers say as much as 90% of all depression is rooted in unresolved anger. Well, I can tell you it will cause your stomach to do this. But here's what's worse. What's this verse say? You know, we don't think about, you know, the spirit world and, and, and you know, Jesus came to what? To give life. The enemy came to destroy and to steal and to kill. What's this verse say? Be angry, yet don't sin. Don't let the enemy get a foothold. You know, when you go to bed mad, when you have unresolved anger, when you push it down, you're inviting demonic spirits to begin to divide. And then you start playing in your mind and blame shifting. Man, I'll tell you what, it is a serious thing to be able to say, I feel angry. I don't know how we need to resolve it, but I feel angry about. Uh, one of the little tools, and I, I feel bad giving this away because I paid my $90 for 12 weeks, but I'm giving it to you free, so I want you to write this down. A skill here is what we call I feel messages. Our Christian counselor get on a three by five card, it was on our refrigerator for two years. I feel blank when you blank. Okay, you, you want me to go over that again, slower? Okay, I feel blank, hurt, angry, frustrated, lonely, when you blank, don't come home on time, don't call, are not affectionate or responsive. I feel blank when you blank. See, what we tend to do is we use ought and should and never and always. You should never know that, you always do that, you... How do parents talk to children? Ought, should, never, always. When you hear that from your mate, those are fighting words. You, you, you tell a man, you never, you ought, you should. His manhood is challenged. You want to, you want, hey, you think that's it? And when you say that to a woman, it's like some, you're not my father talking down to me and making me feel small. Well, if you think, you think she's withdrawing now, what, you keep talking like that. My wife and I bumped heads and we didn't know how to resolve anger and that card was on here and I had one thing that drove her crazy. Uh, she would make dinner and she is what we call a dot communicator. I'm a dash communicator. Dot communicators mean when they say something, there's a period at the end of it. We're going to eat at 5.30, dot. It's concrete, that, I mean, not 5.31, 5.30. And when you come in at 20 till six, I'm a dash. 5.30, you say, hey, let's meet at 5.30. To me, that's ah, 20 after 5, 20 to 6, depending on traffic, depending on whatever else is happening. I'm sure you understand. I understand. I'll give you grace. You give me grace. Okay, I'm a dash. I'm married to a dot. Yet another difference. So it's 5.30. And I come in not at 20 till, and I don't call, and it's now 6 o'clock, and I'm thinking, you don't understand. I'm working full time. I'm going to school full time. Like two afternoons, I can play pickup basketball. When you play pickup basketball, when you win, you stay on. Okay? Okay? I've won three games. I'm not going to leave when I'm still on. I mean, this is my one little fun. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm the skinny little white kid playing. I, I'm on. I'm, I'm going to, I can't go home. And so I come home like 30, 40 minutes late, and I've had a great time playing basketball, and then here we go again. You ought, you should, you never, here's the cold supper. And man, we fought about it. And then so we, we communicated as we did. She would shut down for two or three days and I would, you know, try and make it up to her. And, and then I kept doing the same thing. And I'll never forget, I came home typically late and instead of she acting like my mother, and by the way, when your wife acts like your mother, just, just take it to the bank, honey. We were gonna bam, you know, right? And so she didn't have her hands on her hips and there was candles and all the, she goes, uh, your, your food's in the oven. I'll get it for you if you want to sit down. Uh-oh. <laughs> do, 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 you know, you know. I don't know what this counselor's teaching her, but it's getting scary. And so she brings it, and she sets it down. And she said, I want you to know the kids and I had a, had a good meal. I said, oh. You know, I'm thinking, oh, gosh, I'm not sure how to handle this. And so I sat down, and I started to eat. And she just waited, calm, under control, clothed, in her right mind. And I had all my defenses up, and, and then I'll never forget, she looked at me and she said, uh, Chip, I feel like you don't love me 
when I spend all day cooking a meal to express my love to you and you don't show up and you don't call. It was like, get up and fight like a real man. <laughs> you know, eyes watering up. I feel like, see, do you see where the attack has gone? It's an I feel message. And pretty soon it was I feel frustrated. I feel confused. I feel lonely. Um, I feel left out. And you can learn to begin to express anger with this little message that doesn't attack the person. And then, you know, I don't know, something happened, I just thought, now wait a second, I love to play ball, but I love my wife. If this makes her feel like I don't love her, hey guys, I got news for you. You know what? Get a brother over here and it's chain link fence. I said, you know what, this is your lucky day. I'm on and this is my team and you get my spot, I gotta go. Okay, you can run. And I got home, I mean, it got to be, I rarely ever was not on time. Because as long as she was chiding me, as long as she was trying to get to change me, instead of opening her heart and telling me how she felt, then we were in a battle. When I realized I was wounding her, well, I mean, I may not be sensitive, but I'm not a jerk. That is what, you know, isn't it the kindness of the Lord that brings us to repentance? It was her kindness that transformed me, not her nagging. The third principle out of this is be diligent. Work hard on your relationships. Verse 28, if you used to be a thief, you must not, you must not only give up stealing, you must learn to make an honest living so that you may be able to give to those in need. And the idea here is be diligent. You know, he's talking about this transformation in relationships, and he says, yeah, you used to be a thief. What's, what's the idea of a thief? It's a shortcut. Stealing is no more than I want the product, I don't want the process. I mean, you work all week, and then the guy comes up and puts the gun and says, you get your you know, money out of the ATM, and he takes it. You did all the work, he gets all the reward. That violates a biblical principle of communication and relationship. He says, be diligent, work hard. I came to realize I don't have the skill to relate. I have baggage, I have sin. She's a woman, I'm a man. We got different personalities. I realized I needed to sign up for the rest of my life and make my marriage my number one priority and work at it. And what we want is we want these you know, ideal marriages that are wonderful, but we don't want to put the time in. I don't want to go through the process. Great marriages are like oak trees, not weeds. They take a lot of time, and they're really great. But you got to really work. Next, it's be positive. Don't wound with your words. Verse 29, let no more foul language, but good words instead. Words suitable for the occasion, which God can use to help other people. Never hurt the Holy Spirit. He is, remember, the personal pledge of your eventual full redemption. Let there be no more resentment, it's a form of anger, no more slander, and no more l malicious remarks. So we're to be positive. Don't wound with your words. Does, see, you express it in a way that doesn't wound. In fact, one translation says, let no unwholesome word. And the word there for unwholesome word in Ephesians 4.29, it's a picture of milk that's gone sour or fruit that has been completely decayed. Have you ever been on vacation? and you left something in the refrigerator for like two or three weeks, and you open it, and then you open this thing, ugh, that, that smell, that stench. That's this word. Don't let any of those kind of words. Words that build up people are legal in your marriage. Sarcasm, picking, labeling, name calling, talking about her parents, their parents, illegal. They're Ill now, you gotta discipline yourself, but they're illegal. Though, by the way, too, you think, oh, I said I'm sorry. Guess who keeps remembering? Right? I got a second grade teacher. I can still remember what she said to me. And I've been out of second grade for a long time. I got a coach in ninth grade who said some things to me. I can still remember exactly what he said to me. Wounds with words are powerful. There's life and death in the power of words. Be very careful. Every one of my kids, here's a little skill. Write down Ephesians 4.29 and write the word memorize. Every one of my kids had to memorize that verse, and when they said things to one another or to one of us that were put downs, you had to put money in a jar. And I'll tell you what, after a while they just realized, <laughs> they realized I'm going broke doing this. But I wanted them to learn. There's a real thing. You're either putting money in a jar and building people up, or you're taking something out of the relationship. Be diligent, be positive, be forgiving. Be the first to say, I'm sorry. 
Verse 32 says, be kind to one another, be understanding, be as ready to forgive others as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And that, by the way, this is the key to breaking deadlock in your marriages. The word forgive literally means to release. Okay, you release. You, be, the reason we don't forgive is revenge. See, you got to pay for this. You hurt me, you got to pay for this. I can't forgive. I can't let it go. If I let it go, then you won't have to pay. No, what you'll get rid of is your ulcers. And you say, well, he doesn't deserve it. Do you, you understand what he did? You know what she did? Do you know what she said? You know how much money she spent after we talked about this? You know what? You know how? Yeah. You don't forgive them because they deserve it. But forgive one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you. I give it because I got it. And when Jesus says that we're to learn how to pray, I prayed this morning. Father, forgive me as I forgive those who've trespassed against me. And then I thought of two or three names of people that I felt like had trespassed against me in maybe the last six or eight months. And I said, I just want to remind you, Father, I want to release them. I want to pray that you bless them because I want you to forgive me. There's, there's, a, there's a little equation that goes on there, isn't it? And so it's, you never can wipe the board clean and you can never start the healing process until you're willing to let go of the past hurts. And I know at times that mean that's an affair or that's a squandering of money. But God has forgiven you and you need to turn them loose and release them and treat them in the way that God has forgiven you. And by the way, Matthew 5, there in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if you're coming to the altar, you know, to worship and there remember your brother has something against you, he said, tell you what, you just leave your offering, your time with God and go and find your brother and make it right. Be the first to say, I'm sorry. The way we usually play the game is, it's 90% her fault. I'll tell you what, when she comes and apologizes, we'll get the thing straightened out. Well, I didn't respond the right way. Yeah, there was a 10% truth, of course. I mean, it's, I'm an intelligent person, and 10% of the problem is my 90% hers. I'll tell you what, we haven't talked in three days, and I've slept on the couch, which isn't all that fun. She should be sleeping on the couch, but couldn't bring myself to that. You, you, you know what God teaches? The relationship matters more than who's right. And go into the bedroom and wake her up and say, you know something, honey, I want to apologize. And even if you only think it's 10%, own your part and say, I'm sorry. And isn't it an amazing thing when the other person, you know, reality, it might have been a 50-50 or a 60-40 or a 70-30. But isn't it an amazing thing when another person takes the initiative and owns their part, even if it was a wrong response, and asks forgiveness for that? See, what keeps us apart is pride. And God is against the proud. It's, it's my rights. It's I can't let go. Just be the bigger person. Be the first to say I'm sorry. And what you'll find, tremendous healing will occur in your relationship. Well, that, those principles are pretty clear, aren't they? Just right out of Scripture. Be honest, be diligent, be positive, be forgiving. I want to give you uh, three skills, Okay. Three quick skills. One's a listening skill, one is a conflict resolution skill, and one is an increase your love quotient skill. All right? Are you ready? Skill number one is what I call the conference. A tool for listening. And this is the way it works. It's very, very, very simple. And there's three questions, and they're very easy. And uh, I sit down. I remember the first time we had this. I got this from marriage counseling. Thank you, Dr. Dick Meyer. Okay. I wish Teresa was here because we'd have done this. Teresa, uh, what are you concerned about? Excuse me. Mm-hmm. 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 I ask, what are you concerned about? I don't interrupt. I don't talk. I don't solve a problem. I don't make a comment. I can verbally, mm-hmm, uh-huh, yeah. But you just listen. What are you concerned about? And then when I get done, she says, well, Chip, what are you concerned about? And she puts tape over her mouth. Well, you don't have to actually do the tape, but for some, you'll find it's far more effective. <laughs> because even though you're laughing, you'll interrupt. You will. 
So if, you know, this is legal in this little thing that you can say, excuse me, I think maybe you need this tape, all right? <laughs> and so question one, what are you concerned about? You pour it out. And by the way, if you haven't done this in a long time, it might take 10, 12 minutes. But you're not asking questions. What are you concerned about? I'm concerned about our marriage not being where I need it to be. I'm concerned about our finances. I'm concerned about uh, kind of what's happening around the world with all these wars. I'm concerned about our daughter. I do not like that guy she's dating. I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about. And then when it gets quiet, just wait. Anything else? And then you flip it. And then the next question is, what do you desire? What do you desire? So I sit down, and again, I don't interrupt. I get the old tape out. What do you desire, honey? Well, I desire for us to have a close-knit relationship like we used to. Uh, I desire for us to get a weekend away and really talk. I desire that you would help me with the kids with their homework because, you know what, I don't understand math anymore, and you're good in math, but you're never around. I desire, I desire, I desire, I desire, I desire. And it doesn't have to be super serious. I desire we'd win the lotto and we could give most of the money away, but we could have some real fun for ourselves. I desire, you know, just whatever desire you have, just get it out. So, question, what are you concerned about? What do you desire? You don't interrupt one another. And then the last question, and here's the final rule, what are you willing to do? But there's one rule behind the rule. You don't have to do anything. Don't have to do anything at all. Otherwise, it's, it turns into manipulation. So when I get done, I say to her, uh, what are you willing to do? She can say, I'm willing to have another conference like this in a couple days. Or I'm, I'm willing to pray for you at a deeper level. Or in my case, I remember specifically, it's not hypothetical, I'm willing to take over all the math homework for all the kids. Now, here's what you need to understand. Most of us are in levels one, two, and three, right? most all the time, in about 20 minutes, what occurs is you share all your burdens. That's, that, that's your concerns. You know what burdens do to you? They weigh you down. And then you share your desires. That's kind of like, uh, th that's wind in your sails. And what you're really doing is you have a little time where you say, here's what's weighing me down, babe. Here's what would put wind in my sails. I don't expect you to do anything, but now you know. If you'd like to put a little wind in my sails, or if you'd like to lift off a burden, at least you're aware, but I don't expect you to do anything. I gotta tell you, our first conference took about 25 minutes. I learned more about what was going on in my wife than hours and hours of talking about stuff. Because we usually talk about work and stuff and logistics. But just, just have a conference. It is, we did that, we had two conferences a week probably for a decade as we were repairing and working on our marriage, to be diligent. The, the second is what I call word pictures. And a lot of people have done lots of good work on this, but it's just a tool for understanding. Sometimes we can't get into one another's worlds, and, and you know, you, you can't get him to really get it. He just, you say it, but he doesn't get it, or you say, honey, th this really matters, and no matter what you do, you can't. Consider a word picture, and a word picture is just uh, something that, it comes out of their world instead of your world that you might be able to bridge so that light would come on so they go, oh, I get it. So I won't go into all the details of how bad I've been around the house. And this, I've actually made lots of progress, but this was years ago. And apparently, our dishwasher, whenever it was on, the water would come under the bottom, but Teresa put towels under it, so I thought that was okay. And uh, then our daughter's room, when it rained, the, the, door, the water would come in, and it took more than a few towels, but I thought that's better than replacing a window. And apparently, we had three or four appliances and four or five other things like this all around the house that I didn't notice. Teresa asked and asked and asked, and she's angry, and she's pushing it down, and you know, I can't figure out, well, I wonder why my wife doesn't want to be more romantic. And, uh, and so we, we go through this, and she says, Chip, I, I really need to talk to you. And she learned to do it at the right time at the right place. But she, she told me this, I mean, for the first 15 years of our marriage, I couldn't hear it. And so I was near the fireplace. I still remember this. You ever have those moments where sort of a turning point in your marriage, and I can remember right where I was at. And she goes, Chip, I really want to talk to you. I said, well, fine. She goes, no, no, you're going to get mad. You're really going to get mad. No. Oh, surely you jest, dear. I won't get mad. Will you promise? Okay, I won't get mad. Well, then, if you don't get mad, you're going to get really defensive. No, honey, I'm not going to be defensive. Would you just, just tell me? No, I, I'm really kind of afraid to tell you. And, and I said, okay, okay. Look, will you just tell me right now, and I promise I won't be mad, I won't be defensive. And so she said, okay. 
She said, Chip, you know when we drive by the church and we were involved in a building program and developing a site over about a 10 or 12 year period and you know, you know when, you, when you are driving by the church and the bushes are all messed up or when we walk out of a service, if, if songs or different things weren't done the way, you know, you have those quick debriefing meetings and you evaluate, here's what went well, here's what didn't, here's how we need to change it or remember, remember last week when we were driving on our date on Friday for coffee and you just saw just all this big pile of junk and you stopped and said, you know, can you take just a minute? And you walked into the office and you made a call to make sure that wouldn't be there. I said, well, yeah. I'm thinking she's thinking about what a great husband I am who notices these things at my work. She said, Chip, when you notice all those things at the church and you make sure everything is right and repaired because it's your world, I really admire you. But when you don't even see the things that need repaired, in my world, it makes me feel like you don't care about me because our home in some ways is an extension of me. You know, this is like David getting it from Nathan, right? I mean, hey, she, she was telling me forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, you know, this needs fixed, that needs fixed, that needs fixed. I'm thinking 300 bucks, we don't have that, forget that, that, you know. I want to tell you probably in the next two and a half months, every single one of those things got fixed. Because she told me in a way that reached my heart in, from my world, I just thought, oh, I get it. And you might have to be creative. And you know, like Nathan made up that little story about, you know, the, the shepherd that had only the one little lamb. But if you can think of ways to say things that give a picture out of their world, often a light will come on. Final thing, and this is a little exercise that we're going to, run with. I call it care list, and it's a tool for building. And so what, what happens is, remember I talked about the pie of life and how you can focus on the little sliver that's not so good and forget all the good things that you really have? And what you really need to do is build on the good things, and so those other things shrink so you get enough kind of positive emotions in the bank to deal with them. A care list is list seven simple, loving, caring behaviors that are non-conflict producing and non-expensive that make you feel loved by your spouse. So I've done this with lots of groups and seminars, and I get all of them in together. I say, okay, let's list them. Get on a whiteboard. And they give me 10, 12, 15 things. I feel love when my wife, and the top two are, communicates confidence in me. Man, when my wife communicates confidence in me, I feel love. When she shows and initiates affection, man, I feel love. And we just make a list. And then my wife would get in the room with a bunch of ladies. So what makes you feel loved by your husband? And ladies would say, when he calls me from work, when he listens intently to me, when he really acts in an understanding way. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take, just as we close, three, four minutes, and on the part that it says woman, if you're a woman, I'd like you to at least put, you know, three, four, two or three things that when your husband does them, notice they're caring behaviors, they're non-conflict producing. In other words, like if you've been arguing about a cruise for the last 15 years, don't put, I feel love when he takes me on a cruise. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> so, so, you know, non-expensive, non-conflict producing, but you feel loved when he does these things. Will you just list three or four or five things? And then men, I want you to list three or four things that make you feel really loved. And then this is an amazing little thing, but what you do is, ladies, when we get done, you give yours to your husband. And men, you give yours to your wife. And they don't have to do any of them, but what I'm going to suggest is choose one of these and just do one each day. Wouldn't it be amazing to know that I can at least do one thing every day when I do it, my wife's going to go, wow, he loves me. Wow, he loves me. And for some of you, extra milers, do two a day. Right? And what, what you're going to be doing is you actually, rather than guessing, we spend so much of our energy thinking, I did that, she didn't respond, he did that, you know. Why not make a list and say, I really feel loved when these things happen, and then give it to the other person with ammunition to say, you are free to love me as much as you want. Right? Christ loves so much he died for his church. Is it too much that we would tell one another clearly what makes us experience love from that person and then by a willful choice begin to do the things that communicate love? And what you'll find is that sliver that bothers you will just keep shrinking because what you're going to begin to do is you're going to create an atmosphere where the deeper, more painful vulnerabilities that you will get to later, it, it, it can happen in a healthy place where you feel more secure.